Okay, good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, so for those that weren't on when I first introduced myself, my name is Gary Baxter. I am part of the Vigilance software team who are the creators for CyberComply. A couple of the people that I can see that are in attendance today are already previous users or existing users of our systems in one way, shape or form. And the idea of this afternoon's webinar and presentation is to not only show you how uh, cyber comply as a complete platform or assist you in obviously essentially uh, complying by uh, designing by default. It's more just to obviously show how existing elements that you might already be using will then start to tie in with the rest of the uh, platform itself. So we'll go through a couple of slides to begin with, just to both introduce myself, the team, and the platform uh, in general, and then we'll switch over to the system itself so we can give you a bit more of a thorough insight as to what uh, we uh, have on offer, so to speak. So just to go through a couple of uh, introductions. This is the core Vigilant software team that we have here. So going from left to right, we have Gemma Platt, our managing executive. Uh, there's myself, uh, Gary Baxter, sales and support executive, and my direct uh, colleague, Amy Bude. Uh, we both uh, work in the function of sales of the system. We also offer in-depth technical support where uh, possible, and we're also backed by a very uh, comprehensive and knowledgeable uh, development team for the platform as well. Finally, on the far right hand corner, we have a gentleman, Nicholas King. He is our product marketing manager and essentially is responsible for uh, setting these type of webinars up as well as obviously showcasing the system uh, to both existing and new users to our organization. So as I mentioned earlier, there may be some people that are already familiar or already using some of our uh, tools in one way, shape or form. So just to give you a breakdown as to how it works, Cyber Comply is our uh, overarching system. It's essentially where every single element or product ties in with one another. Included in that is VS Risk Cloud. We've already done a privacy risk uh, webinar a couple of weeks uh, previous to this one. The data flow mapping tool, uh, we've also done one that's focusing mainly on that. Compliance manager, the DPIA tool, and the GDPR manager. So some of these should be relatively self-explanatory by their naming, and hopefully by the end of this webinar, there should be a little bit more clearer in your mind as to exactly what they do when it comes to obviously your compliance and risk journey. So as I mentioned earlier, the tool itself is essentially created. It's data protection by design and by default. I um, mean, it's a very common phrase you'll see when dealing with uh, the GDPR, uh, but also it's also uh, something you may come across when you're dealing with risk management, asset management, uh, DPIAs, etc. So what we're going to do is in today's discussion, we're going to obviously go through a quick introduction as to what CyberComply is. We're going to cover a, a project overview. So uh, to some of the existing users, this will be an opportunity to see the dashboard or at least have it explained to you in more detail. The next area will then be understanding what our tools can do, uh, a kind of a, a higher level how-to guide, so to speak. We then have our ready for an audit section, which is essentially where we just cover off some of the main and more crucial reports that you're going to need to pull out of the system, both for auditing, but also if you're required to, let's say by the ICO, you're able to show or demonstrate how you're trying to comply or you are complying with the GDPR at large. The very last section is then how to complete or conduct data protection by design and by default. That's essentially going through the system. Uh, so that all also ties in with understanding the tools and the reporting. And then in the last five to 10 minutes, uh, depending on what time you have left at the end of this hour, we'll then go through a Q&A session. As I said earlier, the Q&A session, we will do our best to answer what we can on today's uh, webinar. But if there is something that we're unable to do, then obviously we'll come back to you at a later point after the meeting. So an introduction to what CyberComply is. Uh, we did touch on this just a second ago. CyberComply is now our complete offering. The system essentially was created on the back of our uh, original software production, which was for VS Risk, which was a 27,001 risk management uh, solution. From that, we then obviously grew with the uh, up and coming regulation for GDPR. So we then created the data flow mapping tool. We've now migrated all of our systems into a uh, one-stop shop, so to speak. So you'll now have CyberComply hosted in one area. There's no need to keep dotting around different areas, uh, both desktop or cloud versions, uh, different uh, software installations and so on. Off of that, we then had our compliance manager, which is essentially a 
repository or a library referencing tool which will give you access to DPA 2018, so specific to United Kingdom, uh, their Data Protection Act in line with the GDPR. There is then the uh, aforementioned EU GDPR regulation in there. There's sections in the Compliance Manager which allows you to upload your own uh, contracts, for example, your own regulations are unique or specific to your own organisation. And then finally, there's the controls that we offer for both risk management, but also in line with things like BS 10,012 uh, for uh, PIMS, etc. In addition to that, we then created the Data Protection Impact Assessment, which started to use elements of our original VS Risk platform as with uh, most DPIAs, there is an element of risk assessment involved in that. Uh, and then finally, we finished off with our GDPR manager, which is in uh, a tool that's essentially been created to assist an organization to keep track of those uh, dreaded DSARs, for example. Uh, it's also an area where you can essentially conduct your own internal uh, PIMS gap analysis. You can understand where your uh, shortfalls are when it comes to uh, personal information and how you manage that. We then have breach reporting areas, so you can keep track of when the breach happened and obviously keeping yourself in line with what the ICO's requirements are with regards to reporting and how to then handle it. Uh, and then there's a number of other areas which we'll also cover off in today's webinar. So the CyberComply platform, we'll just run through these, uh, is essentially it's designed to be scalable. It's The system itself can either be used as a uh, introduction to compliance or it can also be aimed at a more advanced organization where they already have the uh, workings in place they just need somewhere where they can actually share that content on a easy to access platform so essentially cyber comply has been built in the vision of it being able to evolve and increase when your threats do as a business if you're uh, an upcoming or growing business yourself it's built to be uh, repeatable for frequent risk assessments so by that, I mean there's no need to keep rerunning things. You don't have to keep uh, re-entering information. It is just a matter of building on a pre-existing platform or a pre-existing uh, register that you already have built inside the system itself. And you've probably... Uh, uh, seen this before and obviously it is really the reason why a lot of people are now moving to software solutions it is to move away from more some more of the more traditional methods such as spreadsheets which can either become complex and cumbersome they're either uh, or they could be only known by a select few within the business it then makes it very difficult to make it uh, shared among the organization allowing others to obviously either add on their own input or make modifications without potentially messing up the entire assessment or uh, project itself that way it keeps things uh, consistent and it will then uh, take away or remove, like I said a second ago, the human interpretation or errors that come along with that type of thing. It's then also built to be maintainable for multiple stakeholders across the organization. And just to touch on that briefly, what we built into the system is the ability to have uh, organization administrators, which we've kind of coined the phrase of super users. These users will have the ability to not only uh, choose who has access and what level, they will also be able to work on every single element of the project, whether it be for risk, whether it be for asset management, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. There are other levels such as contributors, which is a slightly reduced version of the admin, but a nice accompaniment that we've put into the tool is for an unlimited amount of read onlys that you can have. Again, so you can give visibility to stakeholders such as upper management, uh, C-level board, that aren't necessarily contributing to the project, but may wish to have some form of visibility or understanding as to how the organization is moving in uh, line with compliance and also risk understanding as well. And then lastly, like we touched on earlier, it is just to keep everything all in one place making a slight, uh, making it a lot better for uh, quick and very cost effective routes for compliance. Essentially, it's just a matter of accessing it, run your reports if you have a question, there's no need to fumble around in different uh, areas across your networks, try and find out pieces of information. So just to go through now the certain elements of what we're going to be covering off, uh, the project overview, so welcome to the dashboard. As we can see by the image, this is a uh, kind of a teaser as to what we're going to look at in just a second. And what we can see just on the image here is essentially what you're going to be uh, viewing the minute you log into your tool. So the minute you log in, you're going to be able to see a quick 
uh, overview of, let's say, what tasks you've got outstanding, how many DPIAs you've conducted, and how many have got certain tasks outstanding on those. You'll also be able to see uh, the implementation stage or level of certain control sets and also your compliance journey when you're looking at regulations for EU GDPR and the DPA. You'll also see in the very top left-hand corner, uh, there's two rings and they are essentially showing your compliance level when you're conducting your own gap analysis. And then further down, you'll, uh, you'll start to see a, ge a geographical imagery to understand where your assets are based. Uh, and that's to really help understand really what sort of scope you're dealing with with an organization. We'll then move on into understanding the tools. So this is the how-to guide. And just to give you a quick introduction to each one. So VS Risk Cloud, um, like I said, it was originally our bread and butter as an organization. We built it to assist not only experts in the field, but also uh, newcomers to conduct and risk assessments. It's essentially been created by ourselves, who we have uh, been fortunate enough to pull off the expertise from ex uh, subject matter experts, both for ISO 27001 and a number of other control sets as well. We then have our compliance manager, and it's designed to uh, help users meet their legal and regulatory requirements by keeping track of their compliance with applicable laws uh, and so on, like I mentioned just a moment ago. And obviously, we'll show you in a bit more detail in just a second. The data flow mapping tool, uh, which I believe some of you on the meeting today are already users of, uh, this is built to simplify and obviously show in a very uh, easy way how your information is handled within the business, where it's transferred to and from. And then obviously give you an end report, which you can then provide uh, to show compliance to uh, anybody that needs to see that, such as the ICO. We then have the DPIA tool, which helps you save time and reduce errors. So you're not having to work off very complex uh, spreadsheets. You're not having to ensure formulas are working correctly. And this will take you through each and every single requirement that the ICO will require. And it will just really highlight uh, if you do actually need to conduct one. So essentially, it saves you time in a okay, cable. Well, are we actually conducting this because we have to, or are we doing it just for the sake of doing it? This will help you identify that. And then lastly, we have our latest uh, edition, which is the uh, GDPR Manager, which is our forum on compliance solution to help with uh, the GDPR uh, activities with one tool itself. We'll then move on into the reporting. So the snippet that we've shown on the screen here is the statement of applicability, which has just undergone some recent work. So this will now be the latest uh, iteration of that. Uh, so we can also show you uh, all the latest updates, which I believe went through a couple of days ago into the system as well. So we're now going to switch over into the tool itself. Uh, and all being well, we should all be able to see the dashboard in just a second when we finish switching across uh, the screens my side here. So, I'm just going to wait for confirmation from my colleague. Yes, okay, so we can now see the dashboard. So, some of you may have seen this and not really known or understood what it did, or there might have been a bit more information on here than you'd have first anticipated. Essentially, what it's going to be highlighting is certain elements or uh, the key areas that you're mainly focused on, or essentially just a, a quick snippet shot, uh, which would be helpful for those read-only accounts, or even just yourself to log on, maybe on a daily basis to see if there's any outstanding tasks. The entire dashboard is customizable to the user themselves, and it will automatically refresh itself every 15 minutes unless you force refresh at the top right-hand corner. If, for example, you're working predominantly on your risk management system for the time being, you can modify just simply by dragging and dropping the elements uh, on the dashboard itself to bring that more into view. So we can see here both our organization risks along with our privacy risks. So that's going to be DPIAs, but also how it ties in with uh, inside VS Risk itself as well. From the home page here, we can scroll down to give you a much more complex view. So my system will have access to everything, and we've gone through and obviously conducted certain areas to give it a bit more uh, filler for these presentations. So the next area you move on into is going to be your processes. So we can see how many have started, how many of um, um, sorry, how many of your processes are conducted are using sensitive data, etc. And then lastly, the graph or the uh, image down here to show you where your assets are predominantly based. And then the very last section uh, is tasks and then any legal requirements. But like I mentioned, all of this can be modified or moved around as you see fit. So once we're happy uh, and obviously we've understood the dashboard, we can then go through and start understanding other areas. So we've got request assistance, which will introduce you to myself and Amy and the rest of the team here. Uh, just to give you a bit of reassurance on that, uh, Amy and myself have both undergone both risk management and 
uh, GDPR courses to practitioner level so that we are better able to give you assistance in the more complex issues uh, that you might have when trying to map data or understanding the correct method in which you might be wishing to conduct a risk assessment. The next area is your user details. Uh, this is essentially just you as a user, your name, username, password, etc. Your account summary, which will give you an overview as to what your active subscriptions are. And it's also the area where that admin or the super user can access to then uh, modify people's rights to the system and also to remove, revoke or add new users uh, where that necessary need is uh, required. The last section on here is something we're going to go through. Essentially, it's the way that the user yourself will make uh, uh, CyberComply more applicable to yourselves and more uh, specified to your specific needs. So here, the first section will be classifications. This is utilized in a number of different areas. The first one is being on records of data, which we'll cover off. And this is an unlimited amount of fee, uh, fields. So you can either toggle them off and remove them. If they are being used, they will give you a warning before you delete them, uh, just to obviously uh, reduce on errors in that state. The next section you'll come to is custom regions. Uh, the reason why we implemented this is a prime example is ourselves here. We all operate on the same business park. However, we're in separate buildings, which in turn brings uh, different um, asset locations and also different threats and vulnerabilities to those specific assets. So here you can highlight the specific jurisdiction. So we're still going to be in the United Kingdom. So we're still an EEA state, but we may then wish to stay down here, unit six, unit one, unit four, for example. The next area we then come into is then going to be your contact details. Now this is uh, more specific to when you're creating data process maps, and it's when you're automatically assigning yourself to be in the controller of a process, it will automatically populate both that uh, first stage as well as the report itself. So it will automatically say, yes, this is the company's contact details. This is their data protection officer's information. And then finally, where necessary, it will also show the representative as well. The next tab down on here is where you'll enter in your personal data items. The system itself does have a preset list built into it. So it's a good starter for 10, so to speak. But if you do have more custom data items, they can be added in at this point. It's very simple to do so. Simply select our data item, enter in essentially what you need to put in here. So we can enter in its free text and we can even just toggle it off at this stage if it's not going to be a data item we're currently using, but maybe using later on down the line. The next section will then be your data subjects. So if you want to be more specific on who they are, not just simply have them listed as data subject, that can be added on and I'll show you whether that's used later. We then have data sources, so we can customize where we're obtaining information from, not just simply have it listed as data input. And then lastly, we have an area where we can input our custom threats and vulnerabilities. And this will tie in when we're looking at our risk management, et cetera. So now that we've done all this, we're gonna go back to our dashboard and we're gonna essentially go through the tool itself. So at the top here on this blue drop down bar, we have the uh, navigation bar. This is how we're going to access certain parts of the tool itself. So we have our dashboard assets, which we'll go through in just a second, an area where you can store contracts or documentation, your ISMS controls, things like 27001, PCI, etc. We then have legal, so GDPR, UK laws, processes. I'll just come back out of that, sorry. Go down to this drop down menu again. So, under processes, that will take you through to the data flow mapping tool and also any DPIA projects that you have ongoing. Risk assessments, obviously, that's for 27001 or NIST or anything else you're using to conduct a ISMS risk assessment. We then have any tasks. If we expand on this menu, we will be able to see breach reports that we've uh, started, data subject requests, organizational tasks, and then any third party management that we wish to be. Uh, working through as well. And then very lastly on here, we have that PIMS gap analysis as well to help you understand where your gaps or your shortfalls might be when you're trying to comply with the regulation. So the first section we're going to go through is assets. Now assets, uh, it's been specifically built to be very uh, easy to use uh, straight off the bat. At the top here, we have the ability to create a new asset from scratch and it will give you a number of fields to really make it uh, specific to yourselves and also to help you understand what asset is, where they are, who owns it, etc. So we can see things like the asset type, its reference, who operates it, who's the owner of the asset, its location, and this will give you access to your custom locations as well. The classification, 
uh, for that asset. And then finally, it's category. So is it seen as hardware, software, IP, et cetera? And then very lastly, at the very bottom here, you'll then have an overall description as to uh, uh, the asset itself. The other method that we've input is because we are fully aware that a lot of people may be coming from spreadsheets, which means subsequently your asset registers are going to be kept in them as well. We offer a download of an Excel template, so you can drag and drop that file straight in, and it takes a matter of seconds for that to then uh, work its magic, and it's then available to every single element of the tool itself. So just to give you an insight as to one that we work on quite regularly, our advisor mobile devices. By selecting on this, we can see here and expand that we have our category, our classification, and our description. We then have all of those other fields uh, compiled, such as its asset type and classification, etc. And then we have a number of tabs down the bottom here, which relate to every single element of Cyber Comply. So instantly, we're now straight away able to see if we wanted to look at, uh, let's say, our advisor mobile devices or our servers, for example, we could say, okay, we want to look at advisor mobile devices what other elements of our business does that tie directly into so the first section we could see is are we using specific controls on this if we are we can uh, view that control we can see if there's any tasks outstanding on it and we can see what risks are using that control to mitigate uh, the outcome the residual risk the next section would be to see if there's any related legal requirements uh, so if we wanted to jump in, we can see if there's been a change to the regulation, which is part and parcel of the package you'd be uh, using from us. We ensure that the content you see is always up to date based in line with whatever the control set or the uh, regulations are. The next section is where you can see related contracts. So we can see if we're store, if we have certain documentation or policies that relate to an asset, if there's uh, contracts with another third party that we have uh, that involve a certain asset in our business, maybe it's a person, etc. The next one is if there's going to be any tasks. Now, the tasks uh, inside the tool is simply as a reminder to yourself or any other users of the platform. Uh, so if we wanted to create a task, it's simply just a matter of create task, choose who the owner of the task is going to be, deadline, and then finally the task itself. The next section is then something that self-populates by uh, itself. So here we can see that we use our advisor mobile devices in this particular process. Now, there's a number of reasons why this will be quite helpful is if you do receive a DSAR, for example, and let's say it's going to be name and address, um, or you've got the name and address, okay, so you know that that's the information you definitely hold on that person. If you work in an environment where that information typically first hits you through either your website or it comes through a call center, they would be listed as assets and you'd be able to see instantly, okay, they would belong to these process maps. Okay, now we can see a full map of what other areas of our business that information goes to, which makes it a lot quicker for an organization to understand, okay, these are the bits of the business we need to speak to in order to get that information back within that time frame that the ISO has outlined. The next section along is then going to be your uh, message or history. So the history tab is just to give you an audit trail of exactly what's been modified on the asset, when did it happen, who did it, etc. The message board, on the other hand, is simply just a, a message board. It's just a way for users to either leave notes to themselves or to other users. It doesn't prompt a task. It's just there for a referencing system. The last section or the last three on here is related tabs. It's not something you have to do, but if you did want to do something like uh, we have server one here and it's linked or it's associated to a backup server, you can create those links to it by yourself at this stage. We can also see what related records we have on this device. So because we use this in a process map, we've assigned a record to it. We can see that information at this point. Selecting the I button then gives you a bit more of an insight as to that record, its retention period, classification, and what type of data items it actually stores. The very last tab on here are then the related risks. Now, the advisor mobile device, in my case, isn't just used as part of our ISMS risk assessment. It's also used in our privacy risk assessment across the DPIA and alike. So we can see here each and every one of them linking across to every single part of the tool. So another slide that we looked at a moment ago is, with, is to do with reports. Now, there are a number of reports to run. Some of them are more just for internal use. Others are actually more specific for things like auditing or showing compliance to certain regulatory bodies. The one I'm just about to show you is more of an internal report. And all it's simply doing is uh, just breaking down and putting into a tabled format each one of those tabs that I've just been through with you so we can see what records are uh, related to the asset, risks, etc. So 
Now that we've gone through assets, what we're going to start showing you is then how it ties in with the rest of the system. The first area we're going to have a look at is contracts. So contracts can be used in two ways. One is where you can obviously store your contracts. Two, you can actually use it to uh, show a breakdown of your documentation and then link it to certain controls or assets. So if we expand on this one here, we can see policy controls of vigilant software, our internal policy controls. And this one is going to be e-learning for theft and loss e-learning. If we expand on here, we can see a little bit more information on the right hand side. Expanding gives you our requirement for that contractor documentation, source documentation links. This can be an official source or simply somewhere where you store it internally. And then finally, your implementation guidance for either that document or for the uh, contract at large. We can then see the status effective from and to dates. And again, we have a link to each one of those nine tabs along the button here. So we can see that we actually use this uh, particular contract or document when we look at advisor mobile devices and the risk that is associated with that. Again, in here, we can run an internal report. And this again is just going to summarize essentially what each one of those tabs uh, demonstrates at the bottom, like so. To create these policies or these documents, we simply select on create new. It'll ask the user to switch into an edit state, and essentially what that will do is just uh, give you the fields in which you enter in the requirements, source documentation, and implementation guidance in a safe area. That way you can create all these documents, policies, etc., without the worry of interference from other users until you're happy. They're definitely in place, they've been signed off, and then you can publish them to the rest of the platform. So once we are completed in our contractual or documentation area, we can then move into the controls. Now, we've seen businesses do this in one of two ways. They either go through their controls and regulations first and mark compliance or mark implementation statuses so that when they're actually going through and conducting their risk assessment and they're selecting controls, they can see straight away, okay, we now we can tick this risk off essentially. The controls we're using, we already understand that we've already implemented them. We can move on to the next one. Or we can see that it's selected and planned. We'll assign a task to it and we'll follow up on that in a week or so's time. So the one that we're going to be focusing on is going to be 27,001. The reason for that is when we get to the risk area that we'll be going through a little bit later, uh, these are the controls that we actually use. So what we have at this stage is a number of options at the top here. These are just to give you quick search functionality. We have very quick high level dashboard views here to show implementation or compliance depending on where you're looking. We have help sections and obviously select all as well. If we expand on each one of these annex sections, so uh, A5.1, the management direction for information security, and then select on the top one, 5.1.1, it pulls into view over on the right hand side. Dropping down on here, we can see the requirement for this control. We can see its status and it's effective from and to date. So again, it's, we're trying to keep visual uh, conformity when we're looking at contracts, controls, and also regulations. So that's why this looks very similar. Now, the slight difference down here are these first two options that we can see for controls and regulations. This is something that our uh, legal teams and also our subject matter experts have actually done on your behalf. They've gone through and actually linked how uh, the control either intertwines with itself or more specifically how it intertwines or how it links directly through to GDPR. As it's uh, well known, implementation of 27001 is a very quick and easy way to get yourself up to complying with the GDPR itself. Moving along, we then again have each one of these tabs, so the related contracts, tasks, processes, etc., and any related risks that are using this particular control to mitigate it. So once we've gone through each one of these tabs and we've obviously marked out what related controls and risks, we can then use this option over here. And this is where you're either going to be marking it as selected and planned, uh, at which point it will then force you to assign a task to it and you'll be able to run reports on your tasks. The next area is then going to be selected and implemented. In the ideal world, you should be implementing all of Annex A. Uh, or alternatively, you can choose to exclude or make it not applicable. Let's say, for example, you don't uh, employ third-party software development for any part, uh, with that being a control from Annex 18, I believe. Uh, that obviously can be excluded, and then you can uh, justify why that is the case. Once you've gone through and made your selection, we can then go through and choose the reason for selection. So here, we can enter in uh, whether it's used for a business requirement, contractual, statutory, or regulatory. If you use the control as part of your assessment, it automatically assigns the risk assessment tick box. And then underneath here, we can enter in additional information if we need to, uh, like so. 
So if we just copy and paste this just for demonstrational purposes today, we can see the additional notes. This could be used for maybe putting in a policy reference number, et cetera. And then finally, obviously, your own implementation details as to how you as a business are implementing that control itself. Once we hit save, it will then give us that additional information straight away on a view here. And then obviously with any control set or any regulation, you're going to need to run an overall compliance report or a statement of applicability that we saw a moment ago in those slides. The easiest way to do this is by selecting this icon at the top here and hovering over it will actually tell you what it is. So statement of applicability. Selecting on this, it takes a matter of seconds to complete. And what it's doing at the moment is pulling all that information from the control set itself and then puts it in a nice, easy to read format. At the top here, you'll have obviously what control set you're using and what the report is linking to. We then have the ISMS group. So in my case, Vigilant Demo. In your case, it could be uh, Acme, for example, and so on. We then have the issue date as to when that statement of applicability has been run. So that obviously when you then go for your second audit, for example, you can show, okay, this was the first one and this is the second one. These are the differences between the two. As we scroll down, the dark blue just simply breaks up the individual annex references. And then below there, we have the controls themselves, followed by the selections, notes, and implementation details that we saw a moment ago. From this report, um, it's very quick and simple to either export directly into a PDF copy, so you've got an electronic copy, or you can just print directly. If you're in a bit of a pinch on the day of your audit, you can quickly print, and it's ready to go straight out of the box. So once you've gone through your controls, one thing that you can do in addition to here is you can also add in your own organizational controls. So if you have something that is either a, a, a modification on an existing control set that your business just uses best practice, you can upload those. Um, if you have a specific one that you need to implement in order to maintain a contract, they can be uploaded in here. And it's uh, worked in exactly the same way as the contracts area is, and also it's exactly the same for the regulations as well. So organization control is selected on create new. Yes, we can switch. We can then add that requirement group, the subtitle description reference valid from and to, and its validity period. And then once we've created that, you end up with your group where we can then select to add on the individual controls themselves. So it's name, it's description, reference, implementation guidance, source documentation, valid to and from. And again, this is specific to the control, not the group itself. Once you've uploaded your controls or regulations in this way, they're accessible and can be used in exactly the same way as anything else that we preload into the system for you. So the next area that you'll come down to is then going to be the EU GDPR. Now we're not going to focus too much on this purely because it's laid out in exactly the same way that we've already seen with the control sets. We break it down into the individual chapters or its principles or recitals. So if we expand on article, uh, chapter one and select article one, we can see here the requirement, we can see its source documentation and implementation guidance if we are able to offer best practice for you. We then have its effective from and to dates and its effective to date. So if that was to be modified at any point, we will go in, make those changes for you, and you'll be made aware when the update goes through, okay, this article is changed, you may wish to focus on this. Down the bottom here, we again have those same nine tabs, and this one is going to link you through to other related legal requirements, not only from uh, the EU GDPR DPA. At the bottom, we can see my test organization regulations. So again, like I said a second ago, anything you input into the tool is used in exactly the same way that anything we preload is as well. So once we've gone through ISMS controls and legal, what we can then move on into is the sixth option down on here, which is processes. Now, this is one of our longest standing elements of the system itself. Uh, and this is obviously data flow mapping. So it's in line with Article 30. From here, we can create individual groups for our processes. Now, we've seen this done in separate different ways. It's either done by owner of the process. It's either done by group or by uh, function across the business. It's very quick and easy to create them. Selecting create new allows you to assign that new process to an existing group or you create a new group. It's just simply going to ask us name, subtitle and description. We cancel out of here. We then end up with a group like so, and then we can start creating a process using the three lines here to either add, delete, or edit the group. Selecting on my process that I've created, we can see that I've named it our client capture. We can see that we've uh, given it its name, subtitle, 
purpose for processing and technical and organizational security measures. Because I'm now acting as a controller, when I come to run my report after the process mapping exercise, we will then see all of that information from our settings menu for the data protection officer. We can also see information for the registered address and also a representative is, if that is relevant to the exercise. Down the bottom here, again, rinse and repeat those same nine tabs. Some of them are pre-populating, so because of the assets we're using, that automatically populates. And if we needed to, for example, make a quick change to an asset, we could do so. So if we, again, see our advisor mobile devices, selecting the I button gives you that overview that we looked at a moment ago in the asset library, and we can jump directly to the library itself to make a more uh, overarching change if, let's say, for example, a server has changed location or an office has moved. So once we've gone through that area, uh, at the top here, we've added on some other editing options. So if, like most organizations, you have quite repetitive processes just across the business itself, we offer a clone function. It just essentially creates a carbon copy for you then to go through and make those small modifications to save a lot of lengthy work uh, in the long run. We also have editing options, closing and deleting as well. The next area we're going to have a quick look at is the data flow mapping system itself. So the map that we are just about to see is, it's a bit of organized chaos, I'll pre-warn you. Essentially, all it's to highlight is to show you three data items that we've obtained from our data uh, subjects. Mm -hmm. It then transfers through the majority of, um, uh, through the majority of our business through a number of different transfer methods, different locations, and then ultimately we'll show you the report at the end of it. So what we're shown here is uh, three data items coming through. The way we build it is by using the asset library we looked at earlier. We can add new assets in here and they will also be added to the library. We can show data inputs and data subjects if we're showing the return of information or we're obtaining it from a subject at an early stage. We can search our asset library and we can also see the library itself. To get anything from this side menu onto the screen, you either single click or drag and drop to the specific location and then you can start creating the connections between them. At the top left, we have editing options for duplicate, remove, undo, redo, just to cover off those small mistakes you might be making. The hand tool allows you to obviously select certain elements. The move tool allows you to manipulate the map. The connection tool builds these bridges between uh, areas of the process. And then finally, a comment tool if you wish to annotate the map at any point if you needed to. So the first section we're going to have a look at on the process map is the first point of call. So essentially where that information is coming from. So the data source is going to be either a data subject, or in my case, like I specified in settings, we outlined as a data broker. We can then give the data input a name, so it's client data, and then we can start assigning data items. So here we can see the data subject, personal data items, including our custom ones at the bottom list here, our custom ones at the bottom here, so potential customers, UK customers, sensitive data items, the lawful basis, and then the exceptions that you might be having to comply with if you're dealing with sensitive data items. Alternatively, you can create a record of data at a very early stage, and this works in exactly the same way. However, you can feed it a little bit more information, such as the name of the record, classification of the record, so confidential, for example, uh, the digital, uh, the format, the recipients, and the retention periods as well. Once we've done all of this, we can then choose the method in which it's moving. If there's nothing in the list that specifies, we can go to other and then obviously just make that a little bit clearer. And then finally, we can outline if there's encryption and what that encryption detail is. Once we've done this throughout the map, so we can show how that information is being transferred and moved, we can then go through and run the report. One small area that I will focus on very quickly is if you are dealing with businesses or organizations outside of the EEA. So if you're dealing with third country transfers. To give you a quick overview, the majority of my assets are based in the United Kingdom, all apart from the OneDrive, which I believe I've set to Algeria just to make it a non-EEA state. So selected on here, we can see additional information such as classification, category, etc., and that's to do with the asset information. What we're more keyed in on is the information team in the UK sending those three data items to our OneDrive in Algeria. So selecting on here, you'll then be able to choose the data items and the method in which it moves. However, this time, it's not just going to be a simple matter of what items and how do they move. We now need to deal with transfers to third countries. So here, 
it's automatically shown that it's unknown. However, if we know we have appropriate safeguards in place or that we've got derogations that apply to the transfer, we can then choose from the standard set down uh, lists such as standard data protection clauses. What we're now going to finish off looking at data processing is the report at the end of it. So this is something that you may need to either provide to the ISO just to obviously help with if you are reprimanded for whatever reason or you've had a complaint made, you can actually still show, look, we are doing our best. We understand where the data is. We are doing our best to comply. Here we'll have a very complex uh, overview of the, of the process map. So we have all of that information, so DPO representative. We have a process overview, including what type of data items, uh, whether it's sensitive or personal, and uh, the transfer types. We then have an overview of the process map, the personal data inventory, including any records that they're assigned to, the data subjects, the asset register, including obviously the assets information, and then scrolling down further from there, we then have the full breakdown of the transfer. So how is it moving, the data source, what data items, if there's encryption, third country transfers, etc. So once we are completed with our process map, the natural stage after that is then to obviously understand if a data a DPIA needs to take place. So selecting on DPIA takes you into a separate section under processes. If you have the data flow mapping tool, you will obviously be able to see a pre-existing process map. If you are simply using the DPIA section of this area, you won't see the process map, but obviously it still works in the same way that you'd expect. You're still essentially creating a data protection impact assessment just on a process not linked inside the system. Here, it will take you through six individual sections with the first two being the identifiers as to whether you actually need to conduct a full DPIA or if it is actually you're okay to now proceed with the processing of that data based on what you've told the system, based on what type of items you're dealing with and how they're being moved around the organisation. You then move on into consultation, principal questionnaires, your privacy risk assessment, and then your review. Each one of these will have a quick look at our process description. It is a uh, pre-configured set of questions which are directly in line with the ICO's requirements so that you know that how you're, or when you're answering these, you are doing everything you can to comply with the regulation itself. We're not gonna go through each one of those due to obviously uh, time constraints today, but if anybody is on the webinar today that wishes to have a bit more of an insight, please let us know and we can give you access uh, for a short period to have a look through this information. Once we've gone through and completed the DPIA itself, including the assessment, which will actually show you in more detail in VS Risk itself, we can then run a report at the top here, which essentially then just compiles everything we've run through. Now this report, unlike any of the others, will actually export itself into a Word document. And it's actually a method in which we're looking to uh, implement across the rest of uh, the platform itself, just to give the user a bit more editing options when exporting reports such as the uh, logo is something we've had a big ask for recently as well. So this is just opened up on a second screen. If we pull this into view here, we can see essentially what this report is going to look like. It just essentially summarizes the individual segments of that process uh, or that data protection impact assessment. So DPIA with that now being completed, we're just going to return back to our dashboard. And then we will move on into our risk assessment. So the risk assessment itself is something that's very uh, quick and easy. We essentially, like I said, we started off with VS Risk Desktop. Um, it was a very in-depth, a very complex system uh, in which it took uh, a small amount of time for the user to obviously familiarize themselves with it. With this, we wanted to make it very quick and easy and again, very continual if you've already been using a certain other elements of the platform already. At the top here, you'd then be out, you'd start off by obviously creating your risk assessment. Now create new relates to creating a new risk or an assessment itself. So we can either assign that risk to an existing group or we create a new risk assessment from scratch. At the top here, we're just going to create it its name. So we're just gonna call it webinar for today. And it takes us through a standard requirements for an assessment. So what are your likelihood scales? These are customizable both in the numbering and also in the text in these fields if you wish to. We can add additional context onto here and then we proceed on into the impact on the organization. The same goes for this area at the top here, the numbering and also the terminology. And also down the bottom here for your CI and A, these can all be edited as well. 
like so it's all free text and you can obviously enter in what you're used to using. At the bottom, you can add on additional context, whether that's going to be for reputational, financial, etc. And then lastly, you have your criteria. So we can edit these values at any point if we needed to. We can change the wording and then we can also change the colouring if obviously that's something that suits your uh, needs or requirements. We can add additional criteria. So here, whilst we have broadly acceptable, tolerable and intolerable, you may wish to add a fourth one, for example, for like critical, for example. Once we're happy with all of this, we then move on into something that ties into the DPIA and also uh, risk management itself. So whilst we've done impact on the organisation, we're now looking at impact on the rights and freedoms of data subjects. So from here, we can see the scoring. We can It works in exactly the same way as the organisation. And then we can hit save. We then have access to that group in which we can then start an asset based risk assessment or a scenario based. We're going to have a quick look at one that we've worked on previously. So we looked at advisor mobile devices earlier, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. If we look here, we can see those threats and vulnerabilities that we've identified. The ones you're seeing are ones that are already built into the system. Again, you have areas where you can customize those. You have the same nine tabs down the bottom here, so you can see what controls you're actually using to mitigate risk, if there's any tasks that are outstanding, etc. If we edit this one uh, to save us uh, creating a new one from scratch, we'll just show you the simple stages it takes to complete the assessment itself. At the top, uh, the first area is obviously going to be the asset that you're using. We then move through to the threat. The library you see is pre-configured, and then obviously your addition of your own custom. Vulnerabilities. The initial score, the initial score to data subjects, which doesn't have to be toggled on. You can turn that off if it's not applicable. We then have the response, whether you're going to treat the risk, whether you're going to retain it, share it or avoid it. What controls you're using, not only the controls that we have built in, but your own organizational controls you may have chosen, may have chosen to upload. Residual risk to the organization, uh, the residual risk to the data subjects, and then finally where you're going to finish off the risk by giving it its owner and then finally a message if you needed to. So once we've gone through all of that, again, we can run internal reports. So again, this is just summarizing uh, the drop down menu. So what clauses relate to it, uh, what documents, etc., tasks and so on. So that is the risk management area from a very top level view. Um, essentially, because we've already gone through and understood the controls themselves and viewed the statement of applicability, the actual risk assessment itself is very easy to conduct once we've already gone through that. It's simply just a matter of applying the set of controls to a particular risk that you've identified. So the next stage that we're going to move on into is tasks. Now, these next few sections are very quick to run through as essentially they're more tracking tools. They're not necessarily something you'll use to uh, either produce a report or obviously help you actually get the information for that DSR, et cetera. They're just a way of tracking uh, the overall progression of it. The first one is going to be our breach report. Now, obviously, the minute you're made aware of a breach of information in the business, you do need to create uh, an alert, essentially. So to do so, we create it up here the breach reference, what are we calling it, who is the owner, and that's going to be one of the people that has access, whether it's read-only uh, or admin use, when it was reported, and then obviously the deadline for that once we've assigned uh, the uh, one we were made aware. If we drop down on this one, for example, we then have a set of questions we need to go through. So the breach details, what actually happened, and these are all in line with GDPR's requirements. We then have the breach scope, so what categories have actually been affected, etc. Any cyber inc uh, incidences, so has the CI&A of, uh, CI of the information been affected and so on. Notifying the relevant parties, so have we notified the ICO, supervisor, authorities, etc. And then lastly, are we taking action uh, based on what caused the uh, breach in the first place? Once we have all of this, you'll then have a task assigned to it. We can then link to any tasks what processes might have been affected by this breach, a message board or history of what's happening with this particular breach report. And then finally, if there's any related risks uh, that may have been highlighted because of this breach that we've uh, now uh, noted. At the top here, breaches are actually more common than most people think. So you're actually gonna have more than uh, what you'd ordinarily uh, perceive to be normal. So we have added in additional search functionality to find out which ones are either overdue, completed, assigned, etc. The top here, we have uh, the status charges to see how many we've completed. 
we can see quick help sections and again we can run reports from this section as well. Other task areas that we can look at is data subject access requests. These are the bane of most people's lives due to the complexity that some of them can uh, fall into. And again, this the purpose of our system is just to help simplify and keep track of it uh, as you actually proceed through the DSAR itself. At the top here, you've got areas where you can link through to certain controls that might be implemented when we're looking at certain DSARs, uh, and obviously it ties into other areas if there's risks, et cetera, that apply to it. We can see the date of the request, uh, if we looked at mine, for example, I'd have been fined a couple of weeks ago for uh, massively overextending my DSARS requirements. And then below there, we have a set of questions we'd need to go through to uh, has the requester confirmed their identity, etc. So it's just an, an easy way to keep track uh, inside the system as to how the DSAR is progressing. Once you've compiled all the information, you've sent it out in whatever relevant format the uh, subject has requested it, you can then mark it as saved and completed. You can run reports out of here as well as you can with any other section of the tool as well. Creating them is very quick and simple. It's the name of the data subject, when did you receive it, the source of the request, summary of the details of the request, who is going to be the owner, and then finding the deadline. So ideally it needs to be within that one calendar month, unless you can justify obviously if you've had to go through additional loops or hoops to get the information which you need to justify to both the ICO and the, D uh, the data subject. So. Once we've uh, gone through our DSARs, the next section we can go through is then going to be uh, the third party management. So using the drop down again, go to tasks and we can go to third party. Third party is just an easy way to keep track of your third parties that you're dealing with. So an easy way to keep track of any tasks that might be outstanding against them if you need to have those uh, individuals uh, fill out questionnaires before you can either set up working with them, for example. So if you look at the example one that we've got here, we can see the deadline for when this needs to be completed by and who the owner of the third party relationship is. We can see its status and the address of the third party, contact information and description of that uh, entity as well. And then we finally have some uh, just very quick and easy sections to run through. So have they provided the relevant data protection practices, etc. You then have two downloadable questionnaires, both for the controller or a processor, depending on who you're engaging. These can then be uh, downloaded into a Word document, you can manipulate them based on your specific requirements if necessary. Once they've completed it uh, and sent it back to you, you can then upload it into the system and keep it stored. You can then assign a task to this, say in six months time, to revisit that third party relationship to ensure that everything is still above board or if there needs to be any changes made to it. The very last stage that we're going to go through today is the gap analysis. So the gap analysis itself is a, a humongous amount of questions, in fact, 333 in this case, uh, and each one is broken down into sections. So the context of the organization, so understand the organization's context, understand the needs and expectations of interested parties. Each one of these uh, will take you through a number of questions. So if we look at 4.1, for example, this one's actually one of the shorter ones, it's just very quickly understanding where your areas of uh, concern need to be, where you need to start focusing on. Each area will give you four options to answer. So yes, no, don't know, not applicable, and then give any additional information should you need to do so. Once you've done that, we can then see very quickly at the top here from an overview, and we also saw that on the dashboard, how many we've answered and how many we're complying with so far. Each section of the gap analysis is also showing that information as well. So we can see that four and five we're absolutely fine with. We need to start focusing on planning, support, operational, and some uh, improvements as well that need to be looked at. This can then be run into its own individual report. So you can also keep track of that. And also it's a nice way to keep a, an idea of if you are pulled up by a regulatory body, look, okay, we are aware we've done a gap analysis. We know this is what we need to work on. Thank you for also bringing it to our attention. We are working on this internally. So that uh, for today's session is cyber comply. Now, the purpose for today's uh, meeting or webinar was to obviously just give you an insight as to how the system ties in with one another. So what we've essentially shown you is the asset library is shared amongst the entire system. It can be utilized by risks. You can view it inside process maps, data uh, DPIAs. We can also look at it whilst we're working on certain areas such as uh, third party management, etc. And that goes for regulation. So we can see how regulations time with certain areas such as processes, etc. 
So with that said and done, we're now just going to flip back to the main uh, presentation that we were working through. So if you just give me just one moment, we will flip back to that. And whilst we're waiting for that to load, the very last slide that we're going to come to is the Q&A session. So like I said, anything that we can answer on today's uh, uh, webinar, we've only got a couple more moments left until the slot is uh, due to be used again. Uh, so if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them now. If not, please feel free to contact us after the meeting, either by phone, uh, we'll send you out all that information afterwards, or by email to myself or my colleagues. So uh, I'm just going to see if we have actually had any questions as we've been going through. Uh, according to this, we've not had any questions whilst we've actually been presenting. That's absolutely fine. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just give it a couple more moments. If we see any further interaction from anybody, then obviously uh, we will answer them. If we've not had anything by four o'clock, uh, we will look to end the meeting. I'd like to think, say thank you to everybody that has attended today. I hope it has been insightful in one way, shape or form that it has helped you either see, okay, I've got this part, maybe this part will now benefit me, or if it is something you need to look forward uh, moving on to in the future to essentially help the organization just manage risk or compliance uh, in a larger scale. So the very last slide that we'll get to is uh, the get in touch. Like I said, if you have any questions after today's meeting, uh, we have our email us section. So that will come through to uh, our support section that goes to the entire team. If you'd like it to go to specifics, um, you can use my name, so it'll be G Baxter at Vigilant Software, or my colleague Amy Bude, so that'll be A Bude at vigilantsoftware.co.uk, and we'll be more than happy to engage in further conversations to see how we can help you. Alternatively, call us directly or visit our website, and there's a speak to an expert link or a live chat if you need immediate help uh, through that method as well. But as far as I can see, there's no further questions coming through. Uh, I'm going to pop myself on mute now. If I see a question come through, like I said, I'll answer it as quickly as I can. Uh, but if not, again, thank you all for your attendance today. And we look forward to speaking to you again in the near future. Thank you for your time.